Hello and welcome to The Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 139th episode, our guest is Andrea Chalupa. Here is her biography. I was born and raised in Davis, California, and currently live in Brooklyn, New York. After graduating from the University of California at Davis with high honors in history, with a focus on Soviet history, I studied Ukrainian at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and the International School of Ukrainian Studies in Lviv, Ukraine. As a journalist, I cut my teeth in the newsrooms of Condé Nast Portfolio and AOL Money and Finance and have written articles and columns for The Daily Beast, Forbes, Time, and The Atlantic. Since 2004, while finishing my history thesis on the role of religion in Ukraine's independence movement at the fall of the Soviet Union, I began dreaming up a screenplay that would take me 15 years to research, write, and produce. That screenplay became Mr. Jones, directed by three-time Academy Award nominee Agnieszka Holland, and starring James Norton, Vanessa Kirby, Peter Sarsgaard, and Joseph Mollet as George Orwell. Much of the research for the film was compiled into my book, Orwell and the Refugees, The Untold Story of Animal Farm, which has been taught in classrooms in Canada and Ukraine through the genocide education program Orwell Art. When I was growing up in Northern California, my grandfather, Alexei, was the world to me. Born in Donbass, a region in eastern Ukraine currently being invaded by Russia, my grandfather witnessed the Russian Revolution fought on his family farm as a small boy, survived the Holodomor, Stalin's genocide famine that killed an estimated 4 to 7 million people, and as a young father was arrested and tortured by the Soviet secret police during Stalin's purges. Shortly before he passed away at the age of 83, my grandfather wrote down his life story, showing the events Orwell allegorized in Animal Farm through the eyes of a survivor. It was from my grandfather and the countless others who suffered under the Soviet regime that I wrote and produced Mr. Jones. The idea first came to me in my final year of university and followed me to Ukraine after college and to a road trip through Wales shortly before my wedding, and many research trips for several years after. I wanted to tell a story that would honor the millions of victims of Stalin who has been resurrected under Putinism as a great hero, and expose how Kremlin propaganda works, sometimes with the help of corrupt Western journalists and political leaders. The history of Stalin's genocide is told through this short documentary I was asked to write, direct, and produce for genocide education by the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium at the University of Alberta. It features interviews with the Pulitzer Prize winning historian Anne Applebaum, author of Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, and Gulag, a history. Yale University's Timothy Snyder, author of Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin, and On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. Harvard University's Sir Hay Plocky, author of The Gates of Europe, A History, and The Last Empire, The Final Days of the Soviet Union. Stanford University's Norman Neymark, author of Stalin's Genocides, and other leading historians on this period. You can watch the documentary called Stalin's Secret Genocide. As surreal as this journey has been against the backdrop of growing authoritarianism around the world, I met along the way brave human rights activists and journalists who continually restored my faith. In January 2014, I helped launch Digital Maiden, a hashtag for the revolution in Ukraine, March for Truth, a nationwide protest on June 3, 2017, demanding transparency and accountability in the Russia investigation, and helped lead a crowdfunding campaign to turn an oligarch's abandoned private zoo in Ukraine into an animal refuge. Over the years, I have spoken about Ukraine and Russia in the World Forum for Democracy at the Council of Europe, the Personal Democracy Forum at New York University, the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., the National Arts Club in New York City, and went on a two-week university lecture tour of Canada, including McGill University, Carleton University, and the University of Toronto. And yes, I have a sister, Alexandra Chalupa, called one of the most influential people of the 2016 election by the investigative journalist Michael Isakoff, who, along with David Korn, the first journalist to publish an interview with Christopher Steele, features my sister in their best-selling book, Russian Roulette, the inside story of Putin's war on America and the election of Donald Trump. The first three episodes of Gaslit Nation, recapping the 2016 election like a crime scene, explain how my sister was harassed and risked her life and career to alert the media about Paul Manafort and the Kremlin's attack on our democracy as it was happening. And now on to the show. For people who don't know who you are, uh, who, how would you introduce yourself in a nutshell? Gosh, um, I would just say a writer and activist and the uh, screenwriter and producer of the upcoming journalistic thriller, Mr. Jones. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, and so you grew up in Northern California, I see. Uh, I actually, uh, my wife and I lived in Ukiah, California, in Mendocino County for three years. So I'm not super familiar with Davis area, but uh, how was growing up in Northern California? I loved it. I loved it. Um, it, it was a liberal totalitarian state. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, um, I remember volunteering in the food co-op which mm. I don't know why I did that as a kid. I just thought it was cool. And um, like wrapping cheeses, <laughs> like where, I don't know, I guess locally made cheeses. And it was, I'm so glad I did that because now living in Brooklyn to try to get into the food co-op here, it's like a country club. And I'm just mm. like, that's not a real <laughs> club if it's so exclusive and snobby and I don't know, intimidating, I guess. But it, so I'm glad that I had that experience in the Davis food <laughs> co-op and I really lived it up and took full advantage by working there for free because I have a hard time getting into like my local food co-op here in, Bro- in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, a little bit different. Um, but uh, I was reading here about uh, your grandfather and uh, he was from Ukraine and uh, what was what was his story? He, my grandfather was, you know, I think everyone, I hopefully growing up has a person that's very special to them. And that was my grandfather. He was the world to me growing up. And, um, I just hung out with him all the time. Like he'd pick me up from school, we'd go to the park and, and all of that. And what was really sort of like, I don't know, it was, he was just an awesome guy. Like he looked like a, like a, geriatric Don Draper like really <laughs> handsome dapper always in a nice suit and elegant and um just charming and it's all get out and we used to go get donuts together when I was a kid in hot chocolate and talk in Ukrainian about politics and it wasn't until I mean I always knew from from his I always knew from family stories that my grandfather lived through Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine which the Soviets deliberately covered up and the New York Times helped them. And the Soviets stole all the grain from Ukraine and sold it abroad in the markets to raise the capital they needed to uh, for, for their empire, for the Soviet empire. And everyone was okay with this at the time this happened, even though millions died of hunger because of the famine this deliberately created. And it really uh, transformed the Ukrainian national identity and and Ukrainian culture and and a lot of Ukraine's great thinkers were killed um, in the years leading up to this it was a genocide it was colonization they came in and just it was like and there's a painful legacy of this even to this day and that's why it's such a big part of Ukraine's national identity today and for so long it remained covered up and you weren't allowed to talk about it which is of course part of the, the crime and I knew all of that as a little girl. And so that those, that story really stuck with me. And so after my grandfather passed away and I was studying Soviet history in college and doing my thesis work on Soviet history, I was procrastinating by reading about why would the New York Times deliberately cover up a genocide famine that killed so many people? Why would they do that? That goes against journalism in every way. And I was researching specifically the uh, Moscow bureau chief of the New York Times who led that media cover-up with the help of Soviet censors. And his mm. name was Walter Duranti. And in 1932, the, he won the Pulitzer Prize the same year. All the, the same year, all the forces were coming into place to make the famine happen. It didn't, the famine didn't happen overnight. It was like years of purges, uh, years of oppression, years of, of, um, of strangling people. And it was only from 30, 1932 to 33 that just millions started to perish. I think it, by June 1933, there's like 26,000 people dying a day. And, um, it, and, and at that same time, Walter Duranti was living like a king in Moscow and New York City. And he'd go to the Algonquin Round Table and hang out with all these um, Illuminatis in, in, in the New York high society world. And... So I was really stunned, sort of like, wow, you got away with that. And so I was really stunned and angry. And I, and what was the more I researched him, the more I was like, this guy is fascinating. He was lovers with the great Satanist Aleister Crowley, 
and um, talked his way into a New York Times job in 1920s Paris. At the same time, he was um, doing with, with Aleister Crowley, the great Satanist, doing all these satanic orgies and writing the hymn, the hymns in Latin for these satanic orgies and sharing a lover and doing opium and just really living this crazy life. And so I was like, wow, you should be, you should have a movie. Like there should be a movie about you because you're so weird and fascinating and evil and all of it. And so I began this really uh, chaotic um, journey as a college kid and researching and, and trying to write a screenplay about Walter Duranty and his media cover-up, and that took me to Harvard for a summer to study Ukrainian, and then to Kiev and all over Ukraine with my research and all over all over the place. And so that's the screenplay that, that I finally uh, produced in the last year, and with Peter Sarsgaard, our very own Peter Sarsgaard here in Brooklyn. Um, Peter's, of course, a brilliant actor. Mm. and peter stars as walter duranti and he was like born to play walter it's unbelievable wow. and it was really great it was perfect he brought him to life so beautifully and with such elegance and humanity and just perfect it, and the and the reviews just about peter alone you know his critics could say what they wanted about the film but they all pretty much loved peter because he was just so perfect mm-hmm. and one even said that he's probably one of his best performances and so I'm really excited about the film coming out and um, and the story finally being told to, into such a wider audience because it's ultimately a story about today. It's a story about access journalism. It's a story about uh, Western governments that pretend to stand for human rights doing businesses with mass murdering regimes because money, you know, and people want to make money and and sort of the price like, who gets caught in the middle of that. It's the people, you know, the poor people. Who cares about the poor people? Like they just get crushed because, you know, these governments want to make money and do and and open open each other's countries up to big business and profit. They don't care. Um, just mm-hmm. about human rights. But so that so the whole story is really about today. And um, unfortunately, it's about mm-hmm. today. Right. Well, uh, I, my next question was going to be so what inspired inspired you to write this movie but <laughs> i guess now i have some kind of idea so um uh tell me about the george orwell part because uh, he's always been one of my favorite authors of course and a little a little too on the nose lately <laughs> frankly <laughs> yeah, i know it's um well orwell yes i know we all know those orwell quotes and they're all over social media but if you examine his life closely it's so much more inspiration there to discover and i've been thinking a lot about george orwell especially lately and what he had to deal with and how uh no matter how much the walls were closing in and what that felt like for him during the 1930s and and during world war ii when he was writing he kept writing and he kept fighting no matter what and he was fighting a lot of uh disinformation in the media even among like his beloved leftists his beloved socialist democrats like he was very much uh, a lone voice um trying to open up people's eyes to who stalin really was at a time that stalin was being glorified by not only the left but the western alliance because they were aligned with stalin to defeat hitler so um george orwell as as a lone brave voice refusing to give up and his tenacity i've been thinking about that a lot lately and i'm so glad that this film has given me the opportunity to investigate his life so deeply because I've, I've relied so much on his essays and his the details of his biography to deal with this Trump regime and corporate media's betrayal of, of, of just not being able to being the access journalism and just not, not being prepared at all for, to cover the start of what could, could really be authoritarianism in America so Orwell, at a close examination of his life, really comes in handy right now. Um, so Orwell in the film specifically, so this, the simple pitch of my film is um, I have a hero. I have a real-life hero that I discovered in my research um, by the name of Gareth Jones, a young Welshman, 27 years old. He's from, you know, nowhere, Barry Wales. And he, just through the being a brilliant, young, ambitious kid, learning all these different languages, French, German, Russian at Cambridge. He um, goes off to Moscow looking for a big story to launch his career. 
and he stumbles upon rumors of something happening in Ukraine. He's not sure what it is. He has the audacity to get on a train and sneak down into Ukraine and jump off. And he experiences ghost village after ghost village as though all the people have been abducted by aliens. And this is what, this is the remnants of Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine. And he's completely shocked and transformed by this discovery. And he comes out and blows the lid off this thing, thinking it's going to be this huge news story in the world. And back in Moscow, Walter Duranti and the, and the Moscow correspondents working with the Soviet censors orchestrate deliberately a campaign to go back to their, their big newspapers and say that Gareth Jones is lying and that there is no famine. It was just total gaslighting what they did. And so young Gareth Jones, his career is like cut short. He has to return home to his uh, parents in Wales and work for some small local newspaper. Eventually the Kremlin catches up with him and kills him, but his work lives on through a book called Animal Farm. And so Gareth and and Orwell had all these real life connections. They share the same literary agent, which we see that scene between them in the film. They were men of the same age. At the same time, Gareth is fighting to get the truth out of what's really happening in Ukraine. Orwell comes out with his very first book published under the name of George Orwell, which is down and out in Paris, London. And so we have a, a scene, a couple scenes between them, just, you know, two ships passing in the night sort of scenes. And, um, and what's amazing, what the way the, the movie is framed is George Orwell serves as a, as a Greek chorus telling the story of Gareth's journey, where you open with, um, the, this writer in London, George Orwell, writing the words of Animal Farm, and Animal Farm narrates what we're about to see. It's like this is this really sort of delicately woven in Greek chorus of Orwell sort of seeing the truth of this young man fighting against everything that Orwell fought to expose. And yeah, it just sort of this wonderful, important, necessary reminder that, you know, they tried to kill young Mr. Jones. Right. The research all strongly suggests like he was on a reporting trip in the Far East. He fell in with some men connected to the Soviet secret police. They took him out deeper and, you know, into this rural area and they were kidnapped by bandits. And the men connected to the Soviet secret police managed to get out and survive. But, but Gareth Jones didn't. And he was shot and killed the day before his 30th birthday. And that's a very tragic ending because he fought so he fought he fought everything he risked his life and career and it was and he and he died forgotten he was forgotten and the famine was buried with him and the story he tried to expose was lost for generations like it was covered up i mean this the soviet union continued and 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 so it was really important for me to show that his truth lived on and that orwell continued the fight and just to remind all of us that, that we have to keep fighting and just know that no matter how alone we feel or how desperate there, there's always somebody out there listening who will continue our work and, and pick up where we left off and that you can never kill the truth. It's just impossible. It always amazes me when they try to cover up for stuff that literally happened generations ago, but it's just, it's so important to keep the big lie going you know what I mean? It's like the Armenian genocide, for example. I think of that, you know, and they still, it's illegal to talk about that, I think, in Turkey now, isn't it? So, I don't know. I just see these things it's like, wow, okay. Uh, you can't even admit that happened then. So, uh, and they still deny it to this day, right? I assume. The, um, yeah. the one that you're talking about, yeah. You know, the, 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 the Russians do, yes. They mm -hmm. always have all sorts of excuses for it. And there's been... Um, archives that have opened in Ukraine that have shed more light to really back up um, how widespread it was, how deep it went, and who was complicit in the crime. And so a lot of, when I began my research so many years ago, like 15 years ago, Ukraine was, Ukraine's own history was, had yet to really been, be decolonized. I had to, there were, there were books about the Ukraine, the Stalin genocide famine in Ukraine which were told through a Russian lens, like the Russian famine. And um, certainly like uh, other, other uh, ethnic groups suffered in this genocide. So there were several genocides under Stalin. Um, in the famine itself, 
90% of the victims were Ukrainian and Ukrainians were the ones who were largely targeted, viciously targeted. Like they, they sealed the, the borders of Ukraine. So journalists couldn't, foreign journalists weren't allowed to go in there. So you couldn't leave. So if you were a refugee starving, you weren't allowed to leave Ukraine. If you were a journalist trying to get in to see what was happening, you weren't allowed to go down there. And um, the reason why is because Ukrainians were fighting forced collectivization by Stalin's five year plan. Um, they were they were fighting against this because it was the breadbasket. And so they were like sort of the main uh, ground zero for collectivization is forced collective farms, which, of, of course, was the setting of Oral's animal farm. And um, they they had organized uprisings. You had women organizing. There was like full on battles. And 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 so they so the Soviets just came in and just crushed them and did it so cruelly. And um, it got to the point where, you know, one death certificate that was collected from that time said that the cause of death was simply Ukrainian, that that was, you know, that was the cause of death was being Ukrainian. That's wow. the actual death certificate from that time. Wow. And and so that history, Ukrainians have an advantage right now that sadly Russians do not. And that is that advantage currently is that uh, they have been very they have been very good and very diligent in recent years in, in unearthing this genocide and, and and talking about it openly, which is so important because people weren't allowed to even bury their dead. The, the or weep their dead or openly show that something was wrong. They had to pretend like nothing was wrong for their own safety. And so dead bodies were collected like trash. They had body collectors going around door to door. It, you, there are stories of parents wanting to hold on to their dead children a little longer because they didn't want to let go and like lying to the body collectors and saying, no, there's nobody dead here. And people were, were collected like trash and buried in mass graves. And you just had to pretend it was all normal. And that was because for your own survival. And so one one thing that I kept coming up against in my research was that people didn't want to talk about it even in so many generations later because there was it that the, the terrorism had been so deeply embedded in and also um the children and grandchildren and people who had lived through it said that you weren't allowed to talk about it even in the family. So Ukrainians are now working really hard as a nation to re- you know resurrect all those stories and confront that past and that's been so important to their healing and um taking back their story and fighting and because history is extremely powerful and, and all of us have to confront the ghosts of the past and that's an important part of healing as a nation as, as trauma and even the science supports that we're now learning that trauma lives on through dna across generations and so as so is so we have to sort of address um, and plus, it's just a matter of human dignity to say, yes, this happened. It was it was it was wrong and that we demand justice for it. And and, and just bearing witness and, and just acknowledging it is, is, is a very powerful form of justice. And unfortunately, in Russia right now, with their own uh, terror that they've suffered under under Stalin and the Soviet period, if Stalin's being resurrected across Russia as a hero. You had one of the main Moscow metro hubs transformed into a, a, a celebrating him. <laughs> you have mm. monuments going up to him. You have um, historians that are experts on the Great Terror being arrested and thrown into prison on trumped up charges. And it's just it's the opposite of what's happening in Ukraine. And so what, what Russians are being forced to do is bury their history and it's it's such a cruel form of gaslighting where they're being told to accept that this mass murderer that inflicted unimaginable terror on their ancestors uh, is a great hero. And I just cannot imagine how abusive that, psychologically that must be and what what damage that must inflict on, on, on them. And I've seen a, a glimpse of it because when I was in Warsaw, a group of Russian expats, I met with them. And it was so sad, the questions they were asking me. They were asking me the most elementary questions. They were saying, please tell us, you know, as a Ukrainian, tell us, like, what is your advice to us as Russians? Like, how do we talk about our history? And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, how do we talk about our history? Like, how should Russians talk about our history? How do we acknowledge it? And they, they didn't even know where to start. They, they needed help on a very basic level. 
on how to address their history from the Soviet period. They did not know where to start because there's no, it's, it's, there's, there's very little open guidance about it in a society that is increasingly glorifying those that committed acts of atrocity. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and it's like there's something really like you, you said at gaslighting, that's that's uh, telling something that, you know, happened. And they're telling you it didn't happen. And it's like, well, I know that happened. So and there's like a fundamental break with reality that happens then, because if somebody's telling you that something's not happening that you can see, then it's like, wow, OK, so we can't even agree. Well, I mean, that was the whole going back to Orwell, the unperson or whatever from 1984, which later became in, you know, Stalin's, or not later, but at the time, um, you know, so, oh, gosh. Well, the thing about uh, authoritarianism, which you guys talk about a lot, and I think you mentioned this recently, is it's so boring. There's only one way to do it, right? I mean, they just have a checklist they go down, and it's like there's no creativity to any of it. <laughs> you know, there's it's just the same old, same old, I feel like. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's like we say on the show, authoritarianism. It's the same playbook um, throughout history. It's it's human nature doesn't change, mm -hmm. and it's sort of a, a very easy way to sort of uh, understand it is authoritarians come to power through animal farm, and they rule according to 1984. Oh yeah, that's definitely. Um, but uh, you know, I. Uh, I know you have to get going because I want to hear the latest episode, not just <laughs> talk your ear off. Um, but uh, I uh, do want to ask you before we go, I always ask this as my last question. Uh, what music have you been listening to lately? Oh, that's a great question. I love that question. <laughs> uh, and I love when Sarah and I get, we, we do a monthly Q and a on our Patreon for our supporters. And oh, nice. some, of those, some of those questions like save our lives. Like they're so <laughs> funny. We got one about like, Best pierogies. And that was just, that was it. That was the only thing that we were like, we were like for 20 minutes, we were like going off on the best pierogies. Um, so yeah. So what music do, we, do am I listening to? I have been emotionally dependent on listening to Queen at Live Aid. Mm. And, and actually I made the metaphor to Sarah that like, we are like Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody because we're just this weird alchemy of stuff that really shouldn't work, but does. And also we there's no way in hell our show would get made by any media company out there like we could like, none of the gatekeepers would allow us to do what we we're doing if we pitched it to them you know it would be like hey we want to do a show on the threat of authoritarianism in the u.s and around the world and they'd look at us and be like oh you want to do a women's show oh well we already have a woman's show well they wait no <laughs> don't understand. like and so um yeah and so we have to go directly to people to the, the public that's the only, just like they did with Bohemian Rhapsody, like we have to just circumvent the gatekeepers and just go straight to the, the people and just know and just trust in what we have. As weird as it can, as weird as the alchemy can be somehow, it, it works. It's like we are the golden girls sitting around eating a cheesecake and having a slumber party about authoritarianism, but it works somehow. <laughs> <laughs> That's who we are. <laughs> I feel I like, like there's a t-shirt in there somewhere, some merchandising opportunity. <laughs> and in this latest in this latest episode, things get weird, as you'll hear, but then we we end up landing the plane <laughs> as we always do. <laughs> well, yeah. cool. Well, great. Well, uh, keep doing what you're doing. I'll keep listening. And uh, thanks for taking uh, so much of your time and uh, have a good rest of your night. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
If you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways to support it. Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. I have a Patreon account, which can be found at patreon.com forward slash Rob Burgess Show Patreon. I hope you'll consider supporting in any amount. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, and RSS. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. And if you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to the Rob Burgess Show at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Until next time.